So we are almost done with Macbeth, and we are going to be looking at scene four and scene five of act five. So we're kind of right at the end. So scene four is really short. So scene four is basically the English army organizes itself for battle. Malcolm tells everyone to cut down a branch from Burnham Wood and to hide behind that branch. And Malcolm, Macduff, and this guy Seward talk about rumors that Macbeth's soldiers are abandoning him. Now, the only two important things about this scene is that they cut down the trees from Burnham Wood and they're using them kind of to hide behind, right? So they're kind of going around with the Burnham Wood. So they're going to be moving with that woods, right? Which goes back to and Macbeth is safe till Burnham Wood come to Dunsinane. So they're going to hide behind the branches, kind of like camouflage, and move with them. So the woods is going to be moving, right? So that fulfills that prophecy. The next thing that we're going to look at is that out of the people that have showed up, Lennox and Ross come in too. So Lennox and Ross were kind of one of the only people that were still loyal to Macbeth when we were in the banquet scene. But Lennox and Ross are now seen with the English army. So they're no longer loyal to Macbeth. So he's losing even the people that were loyal to him before. They also show that Macbeth's enemies are speaking in a super calm and focused kind of way in comparison to the last couple of times we've seen Macbeth where he's just on and on and on and on and on and rambling and jumbly sentences. They have this very focused way of being, which is supposed to juxtapose Macbeth who's getting more and more erratic right? If you hear noise in the background, Iris just found a bag and she is trying to hide in it or play in it or something. Not really sure, but she's making a lot of noise on the other side of the room. So we're going to go from there over to scene five. Now scene five has a little bit more meat to it. So scene five, Macbeth is waiting for the English army to attack. So he's just kind of hanging out with this guy Seton, who is one of the only people who is still with him. And he's talking about how he's not scared and that he's not scared of things that he used to be scared of. He says, I've almost forgotten the taste of fears. Um, their time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek. And my fell of hair would at dismal, tra dismal trees arouse and stir. So there was a time that my hair would have stood on end. So there's a time that I would have been afraid, but that's not now. So he's saying, I'm no longer scared because he keeps backing himself up with the witch's prophecies, right? That's his whole thing. I'm not scared because the witches told me I didn't have to be. Then somebody comes in and he says, what was that cry? He hears somebody scream out and they respond that the queen is dead. So what we have here is that Lady Macbeth at this point has killed herself. It's usually played that she jumped out of a tower or something of that sort and that she committed suicide that way so the scream that we hear is either her falling or somebody finding her and somebody comes in and tells Macbeth the queen my lord is dead so it's not a very dramatic way of telling him what happened but it's very straight to the point right the queen my lord is dead he then responds with the soliloquy which is probably one of my favorite soliloquies in Shakespeare, definitely my favorite one in Macbeth, where he says, she should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word, so she should have died later on. There would have been a time to sit to hear the word death. You don't want to hear that somebody young or semi-young has died. Then he says, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. So he's saying time is going really slow. Everything creeps into the last syllable of recorded time. Now, again, we're now seeing Macbeth's language change. He's speaking in this more depressed way. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. So all of our yesterdays, all of our days before have lighted fools so lighted as in i hold a candle in front of me and it shows me the way so the past has shown fools the way to dusty death so everything that we're doing is just leading us towards our death life is but a walking shadow a poor player and by player he means actor 
So life is but a walking shadow, a poor actor that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. So we're all just actors in the game of life. We're there for an hour. We're there for, you know, whatever number of years and then we're gone. And that was our time on the stage. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So it's a tale told by somebody who doesn't know. It's all sound and fury. It's all drama and angst. And in the end, it signifies nothing. His last words of it are signifying nothing. So those are his words kind of to commemorate the life of his wife. We kind of have Macbeth now realizing that maybe everything was for nothing. So then he kind of goes back and he says, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go fight them. I got what I'm doing. But a messenger then comes in. I should report that which I saw, but I know not how to do it. So he's like, I really should tell you what I saw, but I have no idea how to tell you without sounding crazy. And Macbeth is like, dude, just tell me. Come on. And he says, as I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham and anon me thought the woods began to move. So he said, when I was up at watch, when I was up on my tower, I looked towards the woods and I could swear, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I saw those woods move. Now Macbeth responds by yelling liar and slave. He cuts the guy off. So Macbeth assumes that this guy is making this up or he really wants him to be making this up. And the messenger says, let me endure your wrath. Let me endure your anger. Let me endure your craziness because we all know that Macbeth kills people when he doesn't like them. If I'm not telling the truth, but I saw it start to move. And then Macbeth responds, if you speak false upon the next tree, you will hang alive till famine cling thee and thy seat beach be soothed. So he's saying, if you're lying to me, I'm going to hang you from that tree alive, like not so you die hanging until you starve to death in an uncomfortable position, which sounds like our old Macbeth, right? Making some crazy threats for everything. And he says that he's finally losing confidence and fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsing. So he repeats the witches because now he's starting to freak out again, right? And now the wood come toward Dunsinane. So then he makes this statement, I again, to be weary of the sun, which basically means that he's tired of the sun. He's tired of seeing the daylight come. He's tired of fighting. We've hit this point where Macbeth is kind of done, for at least for a moment. But then he sort of comes back and he says, ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack. We will die with harness on our back. And by harness, he means his armor. So he's like, okay, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to sit in this castle and wait for it. I'm going to put on my armor and I'm going to go fight. So there we are for the day. She is over at the window now. I don't know if I can get her in frame, but I was hoping I could get you at the end. She'd still be playing with the bag, but she's done. Come here. Come here. Say goodbye to everybody. I say bye. <laughs> oh, she's ridiculous. See, she just wants to run, but I will talk to you guys again.